Hey guys, so today I want to talk about some books that were just kind of meh to me, you know, very middle of the road, and then I'm going to talk about a fourth book that I actually really, really liked. So the first one uh, is called Perfect Stranger by Megan Miranda, and I'm going to read the blurb on this one. When Leah Stevens' career implodes, a chance meeting with her old friend, Emmy Gray, offers her the perfect opportunity to start over. Emmy, just out of a bad relationship, convinces Leah to come live with her in rural Pennsylvania, where there are teaching positions available and no one knows Leah's past. Or Emmy's. When the town sees a spate of vicious crimes and Emmy Gray disappears, Leah begins to realize how very little she knows about her friend and roommate. Unable to find friends, family, a paper trail, or a digital footprint, the police question if Emmy Gray existed at all, and mark Leah as a prime suspect. Fighting the doubts of the police and her own sanity, Leah must uncover the truth about Emmy Gray and, along the way, confront her old demons, find out who she can really trust, and clear her own name. It sounded really, really intriguing to me. And so I went into this thinking that it was going to be that kind of atmospheric, you know, mystery feel of, okay, you know, what the heck happened to this person? You know, does she exist at all? Do we have an unreliable narrator who has created this person, you know, and is covering up for things in their own past? Yeah, well... Like I said, middle of the road kind of book. Unfortunately, the only thing that I wrote in my book of um, all of the books that I have read since 2020 was, let me see, it turns out I've got another book by this author too. Um, it's All the Good Girls, I think, All the Pretty Girls, something like that. Um, this one was okay. Not horrible, but not great either. It didn't pull me in like I thought it would. Unfortunately, I didn't put any more details than that. I wish that I had. Um, I don't know. It it seems like it was just that middle-of-the-road kind of thing for me that I was expecting more from based on the blurb. Um, so, the second one, let me see if I can find it in here. Oh, and it looks like I initially read... Uh, Perfect Strangers sometime back in, let's see, where was it? Um, looks like it was, yeah, early July of 2020. So I've definitely got to talk about more of the books that I read that I've talked about in here. Um, the second one, though, come on, where did I read it? You know, if I can figure out how to do it, I'm probably going to cut a lot of this out because, yeah, <laughs> last thing you guys need to be is bored by me paging through a book for a title that I can't find that I probably should have bookmarked before I started the camera. Let's see, there are other ones in here that I definitely want to talk about that I really liked. <laughs> Maybe that should have been the video I did today. There we go, here we go. Okay, so the second book is, it was advertised as a gothic horror one. Um, oh, apparently this is a book club exclusive edition, Barnes & Noble. But, yeah, anyway, it is called The Death of Jane Lawrence uh, by Caitlin Starling. And again, I'll read the blurb for you. It says... 
practical, unassuming Jane Shoringfield has done the calculations and decided that the most secure path forward is this, a husband in a marriage of convenience who will allow her to remain independent and occupied with meaningful work. Her first choice, the dashing but reclusive doctor Augustine Lawrence, agrees to her proposal with only one condition, that she must never visit Lindridge Hall, his crumbling family manor outside of town. Yet on their wedding night, an accident strands her at his door in a pitch-black rainstorm, and she finds him changed. Gone is the bold, courageous surgeon, and in his place is a terrified, paranoid man, one who cannot tell reality from nightmare, and fears Jane is an apparition come to haunt him. By morning, Augustine is himself again, but Jane knows something is deeply wrong at Lindridge Hall, and with the man she has so hastily bound her safety to. So yeah, it sounds, again, really intriguing, but it just went in a weird direction for me. Um, it definitely had a very gothic, atmospheric beginning, um, because it, it, I don't think it ever actually says the year that it takes place in, but it does seem to take place in kind of a, you know, parallel world to ours, um, where, how do I want to phrase this? Um, there, there are specific things mentioned with battles and, um, different conflicts between areas and stuff like that, that I don't think are actually in our history. Um, you know, so that's why I say like alternate kind of timeline thing or whatever, but just based on how they talk and like the crumbling mansion and stuff like that, it kind of seems to be like a parallel Victorian period kind of time, kind of a uh, time thing. But here's what I said about it. Uh, this was okay, I guess. When it said Gothic, I wanted it to remain atmospheric and mainly focus on the ghosts. Instead, it went into this whole magic thing and I don't know, the atmosphere was pretty lost for me after that. And then especially the ghosts aren't real thing. Part of me wonders what I'm missing, and part of me wonders if the only reason Jane wasn't locked up is because she made it back to town with some incarnation of Augustine. Yeah, I, again, I read this um, going on two years ago. It was October of 2021. But if you want the explanation for the incarnation of Augustine, definitely read it. I, I would not do justice to a description. Um, but yeah, it, the first part of it, like I, I want to say probably the first third, maybe half, is very atmospheric. It does give that gothic feel. And then, unfortunately, that just faded away from me when it got into the supposedly supernatural kind of elements. Um, let's see. Okay, so the third one... Stack these up in front of me. The third one is called Where, I w Where They Wait. And I have a kind of funny story with this one. So, see this cover. You can kind of see, if I can get away from the glare here, but you can kind of see that it is a dark gray slash light gray cover, and over here is a face. Well, I saw this book at Barnes & Noble on one of the tables where they would have different books and, um, you know, the, the things with what they're featuring um, in, any, in any given month. And I looked at this one and I read the blurb for it. Again, let me read it for you really quick. Um, Below the white noise of a meditation app, something sinister lurks. Something that knows your name. Recently laid off from his newspaper and desperate for work, war correspondent Nick Bishop takes a humbling job, writing a profile of a new mindfulness app called Clarity. It's easy money and a chance to return to his hometown for his first visit in years. The app itself seems like a, a retread of old ideas, relaxing white noise and guided meditations. But then there are the sleep songs. 
A woman's hauntingly beautiful voice sings a ballad that is anything but soothing. It's disturbing, really. More of a warning than relaxation. But it works. Deep, refreshing sleep follows. So do nightmares. Vivid and chilling, they feature a dead woman who calls Nick by name and whispers guidance. Or are they threats? And soon her voice follows him long after the song is done. As the effects of the nightmares begin to permeate his waking life, Nick makes a terrifying discovery. No one involved with Clarity has any interest in his article. Their interest is in him. Very, very intriguing blurb for me. And unfortunately, I only wrote a couple of lines on this one, too. All I said was, again, the ending was a bit disappointing, but it was an interesting read. I felt that the end was disappointing because... So basically, this deals with different things with Nick Bishop, and one of the people who works for Clarity is a woman that he knew 10 years ago, um, either throughout high school or met in college or something like that, and they lost touch. And she has a whole thing with... Um, being involved with Clarity because she wants to find out what happened to her sister. And so the ending, I'm not going to spoil anything with it, but the ending has to do with Nick having memorized this haunting song that he hears during these sleep meditations and the hypnotic and frankly brutal effects that the song can have on the people hearing them if they don't have pure intentions. Um, there's a whole history lesson with the, with the um, origin of the song and stuff, and that's actually really intriguing. Um, but he winds up singing some of these, these sleep meditation songs in front of who is ultimately the bad guy in the book and that it would work in a movie because you would hear you know whatever haunting melody or anything that the person is putting across but to just write in a book that someone is essentially defeating someone else by singing I don't know it just it just comes off as weird to me and it just, it didn't, it didn't really work for me, you know, with the ending of the book. Um, let's see. Okay, so, I remember vaguely when I read this one. Um, this was actually the last book that I read in 2020. And where is it? Here we go. Here it is. Yeah, started it in, in the, at the, like the very end of 2020, uh, December 29th actually, and finished it on January 8th. But it is called Black Chalk by Christopher J. Yates. And uh, I wish, I need to start writing more on these things. Um, anyway, book number one of the new year complete. I liked this one. It has that kind of vibe of being creepy long after you shut the book. So this one says, um, set in New York and at Oxford University, a group of six students play an elaborate game of dares and consequences with tragic results. It was only ever meant to be a game played by six best friends in their first year at Oxford University, a game of consequences, silly forfeits, and childish dares. But then the game changed. The stakes grew higher and the dares more personal and more humiliating, finally evolving into a vicious struggle with unpredictable and tragic results. Now, 14 years later, the remaining players must meet again for the final round. Who knows better than your best friends what would break you? A gripping psychological thriller partly inspired by the author's own time at Oxford University, Black Chalk is perfect for fans of the high tension and expert pacing of The Secret History and The Bellwether revivals. The author's background in puzzle writing and setting can clearly be seen in the plotting of this clever, tricky book that will keep you guessing to the very end. Now, I will say I don't necessarily... Um, agree, disagree, pay attention to uh, when books say for fans of X book and X book, you know, or whatever. Um, 
half the time I haven't read the things that they're comparing them to, and half the time, even if I had, I'm like, okay, yeah, I might like it because of this, but it's, it's always the covers and the blurbs for me that draw me in to make me want to read something. You know, it's comparing it to another book, it's like, who cares? But Black Chalk was incredibly interesting. Um, the, the present time thing, i.e. the 14 years after the events at Oxford, it has this guy who is still feeling the effects of this game because it never truly ended. When the game began, when the six of the, these people are at Oxford, part of why the consequences get built up to what they do is because they s ran into um, or started collaborating with a group of three guys um, who I can't remember I think they had a club or something like that um, and they they got affiliated with one another and the three guys decided that they would dole out the punishment slash consequences for people who dropped out, you know, for, you know, the uh, six of the students who dropped out of the game that they were playing. And why it has continued, even though the, lo the remaining two have had no contact for those 14 years that I know of, or remaining three maybe. I don't know, I know that there are three of them that are definitely alive in the 14 years later. Um, but anyway, the two that are definitely left in the game, they're still playing because, ne or they are still, they still know that the game hasn't ended because neither one of them wants to face the consequences of what those three guys from that club could come up with for them. But our main character <laughs> ends up, he, he very much comes across as an unreliable narrator throughout a good portion of the book, um, at least the present day portion of the book, but he he's brilliant at the end. And like I said, it is the kind of thing that just there are several different things that stick with you long after you close the last page. And I love that kind of book. I love the ones that keep you thinking about them long after it's back on the shelf and you are done. So I definitely recommend if you want to check out Black Chalk, again, uh, Christopher J. Yates, excellent book. So, all right, that is where I'm going to leave you guys, and I will see you on Friday. Like, subscribe, comment, share, all that good stuff, and I will see you next time.